Hey guys, happy new year. I hope you're all having a great start to 2021 and with 2020 finally behind us and also season one of Mission Makers safely launched and wrapped up, I thought it'd be a great idea to welcome you guys into my music studio today and share in more detail what my personal missions are as well as the goals that I'm setting for this year. And so I've invited the Mission Makers crew to a secret space in London where I come to switch off from the world and make music. It's an unbelievable place that I share where some of the first principles of electricity and electromagnetism were discovered in the 18th century by Michael Faraday and where there's currently a thousand year long musical composition being played with hundreds of Tibetan singing bowls. What's absolutely mind blowing about this is that the composition started at midnight on January the 1st in the year 2000. And the piece has been programmed so that it won't repeat a phrase until the year 3000. It's definitely a space I take a lot of inspiration from and feel energies of the past, the present and the future. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your mission. So my name's Farah. I was actually named after Farah Fawcett. My mother wanted, um, well, my mother loved Charlie's Angels. And uh, I don't think she could have quite predicted um, what she got because um, she certainly wasn't, when I was born, she probably wasn't thinking I was gonna go off and race cars and be a DJ um, and just do all these really extreme things, right? Um, I don't think I knew my life's purpose um, and my mission until probably around sort of early, teenagehood um, and even then it was more like it wasn't obvious you know I, they were things these two things music and motorsport they were things that entered my life as a byproduct um, of, of being bullied and finding two things that really provided me with a lot of release um, and a lot of healing and um, so the way I kind of discovered the healing powers of music so around the age of seven I started learning the Spanish guitar and my teacher, um, she was this amazing Spanish uh, lady. And I would just kind of leave the classroom environment for an hour and I would go up to this room in the attic um, in the school and, and learn the guitar. And it, it just it completely provided me an escape from my surroundings. Um, and many, many years later, you know, almost a dec pretty much a decade later, I, I, I became a DJ and I realized that my music, that the music I love to play and the music I gravitate to is the Balearic sound, you know, um, and those sounds are very, very much influenced by the flamenco scales, the gypsy scales, um, and also the Arabian scales. So with music, then um, music entered my life professionally um, as a DJ. Grew up here in London um, in the 90s, and of course the internet was just coming out as well. So th there wasn't as much information as there is now as to, you know, can you become a DJ? What's the career path? A lot of people don't realize that you can actually go to school and train for these things. Like um, you can go to, you know, special colleges and learn um, DJ, DJ music production. Um, so when I was starting out, it was much harder to actually even put that as a dream, as a career path, because it was almost like this elusive thing, you know, it was like, how do you, like, how do you become a rock star? I mean, it's just, you know, you don't think about that, like, um, in the same ways as we do today where DJing is so accessible, like, you, you can just download an app on your phone, um, you know, you can, you can, you know, on a basic level mix music. Um, but from what I experienced in childhood with, um, you know, kind of, kind of some of those bullying elements, I, I, and what music gave me in those moments um, was really led me to then my mission today, which is about empowering people through music, researching, curating and playing those sounds that put your mind and body in a trance. Um, we all know that the music can have such immense healing powers. And I'm just so passionate now about like restoring, resetting and releasing that energy for other people. And then Similarly, again, with um, with where it all started, where my mission started, motorsport was also um, an incredible outlet for me. Like, um, I was a tomboy growing up, and I discovered karting, and it just like changed my entire life. You know, I, I, I it, at that point, you know, you put your helmet on, and nobody knows who you are. It's just about you and the track and the rhythms you create with the track um, and how much you push yourself. And also here in, in the UK, it's quite an extreme weather environment in the sense that, you know, you're racing in the wet, you're racing in the snow, you're racing in the summer. Um, and it, it can become quite an interesting training ground for your mind, particularly. Um, so I kind of, you know, my, in the beginning, my, my goal um, was when I discovered karting and all of that, it was really like, I want to be an F1 driver. Like, that's what I want to do. And that was my mission. Um, and then, as you may or not know, um, I got diagnosed with dyspraxia, which is a motor coordination delay um, in your brain. 
So when that happened to me, I realized that this mission that I thought I had, um, well, it's definitely not something that I'm going to be able to pursue. And apart from the learning difficulty being the first reason, the second and third reasons was also the immense amount of money that people need to pursue the dream of being an F1 driver. Like you need to be putting in anywhere from 100K um, from go-karting at a really, really young age, like age of six or seven, to then half a million pounds to get into single seaters around the age of 14 and 15. And then very, very quickly becomes millions and millions of pounds that you know parents put into their children's careers. Um, and that wasn't something that was possible for me um, at that point. So, um, and then the third thing with that as well, and, and that mission um, and that goal was, you know, the fact that like, we just don't have that many females yet in, in motorsport and they are there but we still don't have a female who's an f1 driver and that's the ultimate you know that's the ultimate benchmark and um, that gender equality just it just isn't there um and although it is being developed now um how that's kind of shaped my mission in a way is that i i went to study global business management at university and i was really lucky to start this company that um or this society even that was really around motorsports but what I saw from all of that was all of the leadership lessons that can be transferred from motorsport. Um, you know, there's so many things about managing peak performance, um, for example, which when we think about Formula One, you know, it's the pinnacle of our sport. And yes, as a driver, it's about taking risks. It's about breaking your limits. But it's also very much a team sport and almost a team sport like no other because you have 800 to 1,000 of the brightest minds working for one team um, and two drivers. And those skills that happen, whether it's communication, whether it's about managing that performance through 20 different time zones for however many months throughout the year, um, whether it's about the digital transformation that happens, um, obviously Formula One and motorsports is such a digitally driven business. Um, there's so many transferable skills and I think um, for me now, my mission in motorsport is to really empower others as well through some of those leadership lessons and take those transferable skills. And also as we're going into such an automated world, you know, these human and soft skills just cannot be underestimated because that is what's going to be our differentiator um, moving forward as well. What was the thinking behind launching Regents Racing? So Regents Racing um, is a very special, very special brand to me. I was in university in, in about 2010 and I was studying global business management and I was very lucky to be at this business school where we had a, an amazing community of almost the next generation of leaders that were really, really passionate about driving and about supercars. And I saw the opportunity to really start something amongst that community because there was nothing that really connected them. You know, yes, there were a lot of car collectors there, but there wasn't an opportunity to kind of go out together and experience particularly a lot of the British heritage that we have here in, in, in the UK around motorsports. And because the university is, is so global, I think 90% of our students are international. A lot of them, you know, they would never know that Land Rover, for example, has around 20 sites here in the UK that you can do amazing experiences. The idea was really about creating a community and, and also going back to what we're talking about, the, the different sort of skills you can develop as a leader through participating in motorsports. As a DJ, what is the highest peak you'd like to reach? I think when we think about peaks and goals, I think they change all the time. I think when you reach the the peak of what you're trying to achieve, you know, there's going to be another goalpost. There's going to be something else you want to achieve. Um, for me personally, I don't I don't want my career to be something where there's like millions and millions of fans. That's that's not what it is about for me. It's really about just touching people's lives and, and, and knowing people's journey and, and what my music means to them. And it's also about having the opportunity to, to go deeper with music. So I really enjoyed, for example, going to Berklee College of Music in Boston and spending time learning almost a different type of music, which was um, film scoring and game audio, and then thinking about how I could integrate that into electronic music. So I would love the opportunity to keep studying music um, and also to obviously work with artists that I really, really look up to um, and create something completely different. Where does your TED Talk rank in your life highlights? It's definitely up there in terms of life highlights. It, it wasn't something I ever really thought would happen. I never really sought out to, you know, to become a TED speaker. Um, and almost in some ways that's quite nice because the opportunity happened quite naturally. Um, you know, I get asked a lot, oh, how can I become a TED speaker? And I think, it, again, it goes back to the idea of TED, which is really, what is the idea? It's not really about the person and what they've, you know, what their background is. It's really about the idea that's worth spreading. Um, for me, in terms of where does it rank? Yeah, it's, 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 it's really up there because of everything that surrounded 
the uh, the opportunity because the um, the invitation to speak came with six weeks notice. And I already had a really, really um, tight working schedule at that point because um, I was in six different countries in those six weeks. And, you know, you've got to prepare for the talk of your life. So the pressure, I've never been through anything more pressurized than that. Just because you know as well, like, just what that talk could become and how many people will watch it. Um, and also because it was in the Philharmonic Hall of Luxembourg. So I just wanted to push myself as well. Um, because I felt like it was an amazing opportunity to also perform um, a musical composition in it within the talk. So that added a huge dimension of pressure as well into the whole experience. Um, but now I look back on it and it, you know, I, I'm really, really proud of it um, because I think I did a good job. And mo most importantly, I think, you know, it's so many people have come up to me afterwards who may not have known what dyspraxia is, or they may have got it confused with dyslexia. And so many people have kind of maybe thought, they know somebody or their child or even themselves might have it and they may not have realized. Um, so that's that's also really been a nice kind of um, outcome out of it that other people can take my journey, my story, what I've experienced um, and take it as an inspiration for them and their own boundaries and what they can achieve as well when they take out those, uh, those safety nets. Have you since met other TED speakers? And what are some of the commonalities you've shared? Yeah, I have met a few TED speakers since my uh, my talk and I think, the number one thing that I think we all had in common was the fear, you know, of doing the talk um, because it's just such a such a high pressurized um, thing to go through. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, I've in fact, one of my best friends did a, a TED talk um, last year and I traveled with her throughout the experience. And, you know, I, I haven't seen her very nervous for many things, but this was something that, you know, she was really, really nervous about as well. So I think um, also relating that back to my personal experience, you know, my sister was um, was with me in the changing room and, you know, she was she was doing the lion's breath pose with me and trying to just calm me down. I hadn't slept. Um, and I think, that, you know, those are some of the commonalities that I think a, a lot of people um, will and have faced in that in that scenario. Who have been the most important people on your journey thus far and why? So I'm going to say it's three people um, and that's 100 percent hands without a doubt uh, my family. Um, I'm really, really lucky to have an incredible, uh, incredibly supportive family around me um, that have just believed with me, it believed in me throughout the whole, the whole, my whole life, you know. Um, and you can't underestimate that support. Even the more confident you become, the more successful you become, you always need your family to ground you, to um, to be there for you, to to just support you in ways that, you know, nobody else has that commitment to you throughout your life to be there um, every single day and just check that you're okay and to kind of just cheer you on and uh, and just support you. So 100%, you know, my family. And also actually another thing about that is also because of what my parents do, um, they're heavily involved in the education space um, through the Montessori, um, the Montessori method of teaching. And it's been quite interesting actually because the older I've become, the more I've re-explored my childhood with them and I've understood just the impact, um, you know, childhood has in shaping a, a person. And I definitely had a really tough childhood. So kind of just knowing and understanding more about that through them and them being experts in, in that um, has also been really important for me as well. Do you believe there is a finish line in your missions? I think the only thing certain in life when we're born is death. Um, you know, the, obviously the ultimate finish line is is death. Um, and I think you're always going to have to navigate obstacles and it's going to ebb and flow all the way throughout your life. Um, you know, obviously none of us could have predicted COVID. That's something that we've all had to navigate and, and really go even further than what we thought we could achieve um, to survive this. So, um, but also, again, my sister, she said some, she says something quite interesting um, when I turned 30 and she said to me, you know, 20s are for defining and 30s are really for refining. And I think um, the more decades that hopefully I'll be able to experience, um, there'll be so many things that change. Like in my 30s, for sure, you know, I want to start a family and I'm sure that's going to come with so many different so many different pressures and so many different obstacles. And um, yeah, so I think the goalposts change as, as you evolve through life. Um, I also obviously want my businesses to succeed. Um, and and also I'm not the type of person that, you know, once I've succeeded, then that's it. You know, I want to 
create more and 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 dream even bigger with those um, with those businesses. Um, so I think that's always going to be you know the challenges of running businesses and balancing family and work and personal lives um, between all three things. Why do you think some people compromise when it comes to their goals? I think a hundred percent it's about fear um, and the unknown, and I think that sometimes people just accept what comes their way and they don't they don't want to push harder to to kind of get to maybe the 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 goal that they set out for um and i think that's really what why some people compromise um in terms of what they what their potential is what they truly can um, achieve and succeed in and um yeah i I really think that's that's one of the, the main reasons and kind of shying away from those weaknesses as well and and not kind of um being resilient enough to 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 turn that into a strength what do you think some people misconceive about the industries you are in? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I think there's loads of misconceptions, to be honest. Um, I think, number one, people think that DJs um, just have a good time. There isn't really much to it other than just turn up to a venue, play some good music, make everyone have a good time, and that's it. But um, there's just so much behind the scenes that people don't realise. Um, you know, on on the first hand is just how just how focused you have to be on your health to succeed in this environment, both your mental and physical health. Um, you know, it, you're spending so many hours hunched up, you know, kind of in a DJ booth, you're kind of looking down. Um, and people don't realise that, that that comes with a lot of um, a lot of pain. I've heard so many people that have terrible back pain from, from being a DJ, from producing music, from sitting in a studio for long periods of time. Um, and also, as something I talked a bit earlier on as well, is that... Yes, it's about music. Yes, it's about, um, you know, researching, curating, playing. But it's also about your community. It's also about your brand and um, taking on so many, wearing a lot of different hats um, that come with being a DJ. So whether it's managing your accounts, your finances, whether it's designing your own graphics, building your website, uh, managing your social media, you know, there are so many, so many things that people don't realise that you you really have to take upon yourself to do, um, particularly in the beginning. Um, secondly, other misconceptions about my job. Again, I think it, it comes down to as well, maybe being an entrepreneur and running a business. People think, you know, you're a millionaire because you run a business and that's just not the truth. Um, you know, 99% of businesses fail. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions around what appears to look like success, but truly what, um, you have to sacrifice in order to, to be successful and to, to have, you know, to build that team around you who also, uh, want to be a part of your mission and sacrifice similar things to be a part of it as well. The last misconception or something I get um, told quite a lot is, oh, I didn't, you don't look like a DJ um, or you don't look like a, a race car driver. And I'm just kind of like, well, what does a race car driver or a DJ look like? I mean, are they all a certain colour? Are they all a certain jo- gender? Um, I don't think you can ca- categorise anybody like and kind of correlate what they do by how they look. That to me is just a bit bizarre and uh, and I do honestly get asked that or told that a lot, you know, particularly as well um, being Indian, um, you know, people kind of uh, just think that I might be a doctor or an accountant or something. And uh, yeah, again, it goes back to I don't think human beings are all painted in one colour to be a certain profession. How do you look back on 2020? Gosh, it's isn't hasn't 2020 just been a crazy year? Um I remember when we were about to enter, you know, this new decade and thinking, gosh, 2020 sounds so futuristic, sounds so rad, can't wait to be in it. Um, and God, it just went so south for every, for the world, right? Um, and for me, it started off in quite a, an insane way because I was DJing at the World Economic Forum and I was managing a really cool event out there and also speaking. So there was this huge pressure um, when I started out the year and where I kind of, yeah, where I began in Davos. Um, And also where, you know, of course, Mission Makers was born. Um, Unfortunately, what a lot of people don't know is that um, while I was there, I think it was around day four of the um, of the trip. And that was the Monday when the when the conference was beginning. I unfortunately, I I slipped on some black ice and I I broke my elbow and um, so a lot of this year has actually been managing um, this injury because unfortunately you would never imagine this, but they, they did the surgery wrong in Switzerland and it, the, the screws they put in were off by a millimetre, which is definitely not the Swiss precision that we all know. 
Um, and then with COVID and everything, it became really hard to get a restorative surgery. It's actually something I then got done in October. Um, and it made life really difficult throughout this whole year because like just simple things like playing the guitar, I wasn't able to really like rotate my left arm, um, you know, in, in fully. Um, so, and then obviously COVID happening and everything else. So I look back at this year and I think, yes, there were health challenges that came, you know, but particularly um, when I look back, one of the hardest things, of course, has been music, um, that just completely disappearing in terms of playing live. Um, and feeling this huge amount of heartbreak and uncertainty about when and how we're going to come back as a world and how we are going to get to dance together. Um, and I also look back on this year as well with also just um, being really grateful for the teams that I have because um, with Mission Makers, of course, you know, it's taken a really, really great team to put this together. It's almost been like my little baby in lockdown. Um, and also with the Formula Mind, which is a business that I'm developing in motorsports. Um, and the ways that my team have kind of creatively started thinking about how we can navigate these challenges because the world isn't going to be the same. And what I thought this business could become or be um, has hugely been challenged by COVID. And um, we're really hoping that, you know, we will be able to deliver and um, put on the kind of experiences that do require human interaction face to face. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I'm looking back at 2020. It's the positives are, you know, great team. Um, it, COVID hasn't stopped me from being creative, from pursuing my dreams and my passions. Um, and nor has, you know, my injury either. Do you expect the world to make a full recovery? I don't think that we're ever going to go back to how it was. I don't think we're going to make a full recovery in the sense that, you know, this, um, COVID isn't ever going to exist just by natures of um, human viruses and or bi biologically developed viruses even. Um, what was the second part of the question? How would you like the world to look moving forward? So moving forward, I think the world, um, I think we've all obviously had to really, really learn a lot about ourselves and the people that we work for and what we, the industries we operate in. Um, I think we're just going to have to be so much more sensitive to other people's needs, people's mental well-beings. And I think that's actually a great thing. You know, the, height, the, the heightened awareness around mental well-being in the workplace. That's, that's definitely something good that's come out of all of this. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't think we will make a full recovery. But I think I really hope and stay positive to the fact that we will still all be able to, um, to you know, operate as a, as a, as a, as a globalised world. What are your goals for 2021? So every year I always, you know, come up with the same resolution um, and it's just to focus on health. I mean, it's just so, so important. Um, so I'm really hoping that, you know, I continue working on, on health. Um, you know, I haven't been to the gym because of COVID as well and the elbow injury. Like I only went in really about once or twice in between January, February. Then the injury happened, couldn't go back to the gym. COVID happened. Um, and only recently started coming back in. So um, just really trying to focus on that particularly. Um, and then everything else is a byproduct of where your health, where your health is, right? So um, what I'm really hoping for 2021 is for the startup Formula Mind to succeed, um, for it to get off the ground, for us to get funding into the business. Um, and then thirdly, and really, really importantly, is for the dance floor to come back. Um, really, really, really hope that we will be able to meet again and just release all of this energy that we've, you know, trapped in this year and not being able to kind of just go out and meet our friends and meet new people and all of those things, you know, um, really hoping that I can be a part as well of, of, um, of, of, of kind of providing that scenario. I'm also, um, for 2021, I'm also really, really focused on making Mission Makers succeed. Um, and growing this podcast, getting it into the to the ears and eyes of as many people as possible, um, and bringing in you know really really interesting guests into the show as well. We've also been talking to a lot of interesting guests for season two, and I'm hoping I can reveal some of who those people will be. Um, but definitely stay tuned because it's going to be a season you definitely want to be a part of. 
Thanks for tuning in today, guys. I'm going to be back for the rest of January with a few more bonus episodes talking a lot about actually how I fuel my mission, how I condition my mind and my body, um, and also how I sort of navigate a lot of this with a learning difficulty. So if you or your loved ones have a learning difficulty or you're just interested in improving your health this year, then do be sure to tune in next week and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It really means a lot. And to rate and review the show as well, because we read all of your reviews and ratings and um, we really appreciate them. So, so do keep them coming and speak to you soon.